Y'all have been such a great influence in our lives. We were talking last night, you've been married 42? 43. 42. 42 years. Let's go. That's we can amazing. can celebrate that, y'all family. Can we? It's a good number. It's a great number. And what, what we love about y'all is you do talk about marriage. You do talk about those type of relationships. But uh, I know when you intercepted our life, we didn't have kids. We were like, I think we had been married like 45 days. Like we were just, we were still on the like, hi, I love you face. And, uh, and then, you know. We're still there. Yeah, I was going to totally say, hopefully you're still, still in there. that place. I knew, I knew Dan when the beard was on top of his head. Ah. <laughs> it is valid. I did have a full head of hair. I don't think we need to talk about that. That doesn't need to be focused on. Um, But you helped us so much when we were starting out and then when we wanted to have kids. And uh, we've watched your kids grow up. And Woodlands makes some noise because your campus pastors, Pastors Tyler and Nicole Hagen, are, that's your son. Yeah. And amazing grandkids. You have a bunch of grandkids, a bunch of kids. Just give us a snapshot. And we want to dive in because... Before we jump in, y'all have written a new book, and we're actually really, really sad about it. Y'all, this book is amazing. Is a game changer, and I, I don't say that flippantly. Uh, there's a lot of good books out there, but just y'all's delivery, the packaging, how you guys put this together, how spirit-led it is, and then I'll let Pastor Jackie mention at the end, there's a QR code yeah, you gotta save that. We're that, that you can the scan end. at the end that she's going to talk about. But y'all, uh, they didn't bring enough. Um, we have thousands of people that come to Hope City across all of our campuses. Um, you brought a limited supply. You can scan the QR code if you want to buy it. After we talk today, you're going to be like, okay, I'm going to need that book. We do have them available here. I have a feeling that we're going to sell out for service. It's called um, No Ordinary Promise, and we're going to be actually talking a lot through it because it is literally, we've read a lot of books. How many of you have read a lot of books? How many of you are like, yeah, there's a lot of books out there. Um, this book is different. It's different. And it is, it is simple, but it is so just every word. These two, um, over the years, they are the, they're the one-liner people. Like, they're the ones that they hit you with one line, and you're like, ah, entire life changed. And this book is like every single page, you're like, I can stop right there for the whole week and yep. just think about it. So we're going to actually be digging through it a little bit, and then we are encouraging you to go grab it afterwards. But it's amazing. Beautiful. Well, welcome. Come on, welcome them one Tell more us time. Tell about your family a little bit. Give us another snapshot where you're at, what's happening. Right. Okay, well, we've been married like 42 years, and I would say that probably 42 years of it has been great. Been, been happy, yeah. been happily married. We got married when we were twelve, yeah. so that's <laughs> because yeah. So we were no, we were nineteen and twenty when we got married. So we started young and we grew up together, which is um, has its own set of challenges and opportunities. We call them opportunities. Mm-hmm. And um, so we have four children. Uh, one daughter is the oldest, and then three boys and eleven grandchildren, which I believe we've probably showed the picture before at different times when we were here. Yep. And so, but every single stage of life has been glorious. It's been um, a party because when you have four kids, everything's a party. <laughs> and um, we've enjoyed every single season of life, even in the hard seasons, right? Because they're not all good, and um, but they're all redemptive. So. Go ahead. Yeah, it was a, a collision of uh, opposites, and I love opposites attract, but also opposites attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and she grew up in complete stability. Uh, her sister lives in the same house that she was raised in. Parents have gone on From all five around. years old. Yeah. So uh, I moved 27 times. By the time I was 16, we lived in our car. We lived in people's houses. Total chaos. Crimes being committed in our house. Um, I did not want my children to have my childhood. So when you raise your children and they, they're trying to replicate their childhood, the child that you didn't want to have your childhood is trying to raise their child according to their childhood, not trying to be the Riddler. But you know that something has changed radically in our lives. And so I came out of total chaos and she came out of complete calm. Wow. And so somehow God enabled us to collide together, meet together, and form a new life together through all of our roadblocks and difficulties, connecting, growing up. uh, I was very immature. Uh, You were a little bit more mature than me. Plus, she had a nice, cool 1977 Celica uh, when I got married. And so I upgraded. Uh, My life got instantly better. We got new Tupperware, new towels at our our (laughs) 
wedding it's and better. my life was better. Yeah, you just said something though, not to try to steer us from Tupperware, um, <laughs> but you said not every season has been good, but redemptive. Yes. That was a really powerful line because I think sometimes it's like, oh, you guys, everything's you're just winning. Everything in life is perfect. We see it. But there's been seasons that you've gone through that were challenging. That is life. That's John 16, 33. Like, we're going to go through some things. But you said it. And I love it. Not every season was good, but every season was redemptive. Yeah, and, you know, that whole idea or that thought is we have a choice. We can either make it, um, make it beco us become a victim or we can let it redeem and we can become a victor in that season. And so, but we have a choice and that's why it's so important. And then my life message has been, how am I stewarding me? Yeah. Yeah. How am I stewarding my walk with the Lord? Because your walk with the Lord determines how you see your world. It determines how you interact with other people, your children, your spouse, your uh, friends. It's all about stewarding or taking care of or um, uh, managing your spiritual walk with the Lord. Yeah, and, and here's how you redeem. Simply, it's very simple. You have to turn pain into teaching. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to ask yourself, what's the lesson, not what's the damage? Yeah. Mm. And if you think in terms of what's the lesson, oh, not good. what's the damage, then you will turn your pain into teaching. And if you turn pain into teaching, it's amazing how you redeem all of the pitfalls, wow. the downturns, all of it that you have in marriage. That's so good. good. That's so good. When we were thinking about the two of you, and I would say what you, thank you, darling. He's pulling the, the extra hairs that lay over my face. So it's been a long day. I don't need to mess Out up your makeup. Amen. <laughs> you look lovely, by the way. Why, thank you. Um, but when we were thinking about these two and what they have added to our lives and what one of the greatest things is that we wanted them to bring to this family and to this house is we think of the word steadfast in literally every way that we have known about you. We have seen a steadfast character and integrity in you. We have admired your marriage. We've admired the way that you have ministered. Um, these two have, have planted churches over and over and over again and taken on degree upon degree, written book after book, been the, fa or the father and the mother spiritually to so many sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. And your own children are amazing. They serve the Lord, love the Lord so, so powerfully. Every area that we've looked at, from friendship, to you as, as children, your relationship with your parents. It's always been something that we've looked at and said, wow, they're so steadfast. And, and there's joy and fruit in that. And the fruit that follows, we preach that a lot. The closer you get to Jesus, it, obedience isn't always fun, but it is always fruitful. And the closer you get to Jesus, there's fruit. We've seen that in your lives. I preach this a lot. The seed that was planted in us 20 years ago um, one of the main reasons why we feel compelled, encouraged, inspired, and excited to go out in the lobby. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if y'all realize, like, we, we hang out in that lobby all the way up until the next service. Like, I got sweat running down the back. Amen. <laughs> but it was a seed you planted when I was a young zealot. I can't remember if I was still wearing my hoops, maybe my diamonds like John B. I can't remember. But I remember you spoke into myself banning from Jesus culture and a couple other guys. And you said this line and it marked me. It marked me like a tattoo. You said, if, if, if you smell more like the ready room than you do the sheep, you're missing out on the greatest days of your ministry. So make sure you are out in the lobby where the people are. Make sure that you are hugging and loving. You should be able to, whatever cologne you had on that morning should smell different by the time you leave because of how many people you've embraced. And that marked us. We're in that lobby every week because of that line. You planted that line. That seed has manifested into something that is fruit in our lives. Well, it, it really goes, whether you're married, single, single again, it's all about accessibility. 
And we're living in a day and age where people are, first of all, they're rejecting the idea of marriage. They're rejecting the idea of family. They're living more isolated. They're living very suspicious, guarded. We'll get more into that in a minute. But the most important Bible verse that has guided my life goes to the steadfast idea is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. It's, it's talking about husbands and wives and family, but it says, if you want to see the good life and length of days, mm-hmm. keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Lies. I want the good life. Yeah. I want length of days yeah. in my life, steadfast. And really, leadership, life, relationship at any level It's all about putting together a thousand days in a row that all look the same. Oh, okay. So it is uh, something about today has to look like yesterday. And something about tomorrow has to look like today. The gift I give in relationship, friendship, father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, is that I take away the guesswork of which version of me is coming through the door that day. Ah. So I want the good life length of days, and it says don't speak evil uh, and don't tell lies. And we tell more lies inside marriages than family than any other place. We lie more in family than we do in business. Families is where we tell the most lies to each other. And so if I guard my lips from lying and speaking evil, meaning I want the demise, the subtle, the passive demise of somebody, I'm not going to have the good life, the Bible says, nor will I see length of days. Wow. So true. And the commandment that Jesus left us was to love one another. That's what this whole series is about, is really understanding how to love others well. Jesus said it in John 13, 34, and 35. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another by this Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And how many of you would agree, sometimes in life, loving people is part of the hardest challenge in relationship. And that is something that I have seen come out of the two of you so consistently. Like, not just from the platform, but literally off the stage, on the stage, off the stage, in their homes, out of their homes, so consistently loving one another well. But you said something in your book that we want everyone to grab after service. You said, if it comes too easily, it will probably be forgotten. Break that down for us a little bit. Um, Just a fundamental truth the Bible teaches that fire produces value and endurance. So That's how our faith becomes gold, is through fire, trial, testing, delay. Um, And so if it comes too easily in this life, I guarantee you will forget it. So the thing that marks a marriage, it keeps it notable, it makes it unbreakable rather than, uh, you know, unfathomable or unbearable, you want it to be unbreakable, (laughs) is that it is tested and it becomes stronger and more valuable with time through trial. So when there's delay, when there's difficulty, when there is things that seemingly are obstacles to, to arrive or to achieve, what it does, it deepens the achievement. And so that achievement then doesn't become monopoly money and just some passing little you know, cotton candy thing in this life. It becomes something that notable that sits on the shelf that is always displayed emotionally for that couple for the rest of their life. Like we, we marked time by that thing that God did in our life that was very difficult. We endured the illness. We endured the loss of job. We endured, you know, when I blew $30,000 of our money on a stupid Ponzi scheme, I lost the money when I was 29 and she told me not to do it and I did it anyway because I got all excited about, you know, uh, being rich. <laughs> And I lost the only money we had on a Ponzi scheme. And she, she brought it up once by telling me the guy got arrested. And to this day, she's never brought it up again. Yeah. So the, but we lost that money. We had to become renters. For five years, we didn't own a house because of that stupid move. But what's become memorable and notable is the fact that she didn't beat me up with that 
so good. for the rest of my life. She's never brought it up. Even when money's tight, she goes, well, if you lose the $30,000, you idiot. She might have forgotten about it. She'll bring it up today. Yeah, so. Yeah, she's like, thanks for reminding me. But then when we I'll did, talk about it. when we did finally get the house with the help of your father, um, what a moment that was. Yeah. And I've never forgotten that. And I've thought twice, we collaborate. And I haven't made that stupid thing again, like at 62, like I did at 29. So it didn't come easily, but it's, it's, we've never forgotten it. it. You, you have another line that I've, I've preached to leaders, but it's how we lead Hope City is it's seed before speed. Um, there's a lot of things that we feel called to. There's a big faith for what God has entrusted us to steward. But if you rush it, you'll ruin it. And that's why it's so important to pause, pray, and be patient. I've preached that before because I want to be in the middle of God's will, not in front of it or behind it. Yeah. But seed before speed is key because we want everything microwaved. We, we want everything fast. We preach this a lot. We want everything have it your way. I'm like, y'all, that's Burger King. Uh, everything is the way I want it. But seed before speed, there's seed time and then harvest. And so if it comes too easy, then it'll probably be forgotten. That's and so, uh, man, it took... We're going to talk our week. We, we are actually doing the last week of this relationship together. And I'm going to tell, we're going to talk. I'm going to say a lot of things. Oh, boy. We're going to talk about how difficult Sorry. you made it for me to sweep you off your feet. Amazing. Okay. Well, before we get to that, there's this week one four. Thing. You'll have to come back. There's one thing. There, there are three really huge things that I pulled from this book. But the first one that I saw was um, the influence yes. that we have in relationships, whether that's family, whether that's friendship, coworkers, marriage, whatever it is, there is influence that we all have and people that we are influenced by. And you said something at the very beginning, like introduction, and I want to get it right, but you said, we have listened to older people. Tell us about that, because I think that is a forgotten mm -hmm. portion of how we grow it as is, men yes. and women of God. Yeah, and I don't know if you've recognized it, but you don't know everything. Yo. Do you know that? <laughs> None of us know everything. And I right? think that one of the things our culture is teaching is that everything that we need is already within ourselves, and that is the worst lie that the enemy could tell you. Right. And so we have always tried to look to be friends with, hang out with people that are older than us. And in that, we have gained the wisdom that we need for specific situations, whether we were in our 20s, we always had friends that were in our 30s and in our 40s and 50s, and people that we could look to to see what does it look like to have, much like you guys look to us, to have children. What does it look like to be in your 40s or to be transitioning into an older season of your life? And here now we're in our 60s and now we have people that are looking to us. And so it's so important that we always have these generational relationships yeah, yeah, in our yeah. life be, so that we can learn from. Actually, I have learned from younger people too. Yeah. You know, and they keep us young and they keep us healthy. And so it's all good. It's good to have those different generational relationships. And the deeper spiritual implication of not listening to older people is really the whoosh or the momentum of the spirit of this age, which tells us this. This is all part of the dark side of modernism. Uh, the modernist movement of deconstructionism has a very negative side with this. It says this, everything that has come before me is illegitimate. Yeah. The church is illegitimate. Uh, marriage is illegitimate. The family's illegitimate. This country's illegitimate. Uh, everything's illegitimate because anything that came before my generation wow. is illegitimate now. Wow. So what happens is you have shut yourself off mentally yeah. from even observational development or allowing yourself to be inspired by anything that has been around before you. The Bible teaches honor. What's the core idea of honor? Is that something came before me and something is above me. Romans 1, they did not honor God nor worship him. Mm. So if you don't honor, if your person lives a dishonor, it means everything that's before me in this world is illegitimate. And if you approach life that way, 
you, it's, it's, it's the worst mistake possible is to shut off the role. Now, we don't study old people. The Bible speaks against old. It elevates older. Old, tired, rigid, like an old wineskin. No, grumpy. I don't, I'm not inspired by that. Older people are people that travel. See, old people go from the past to the present, past to the present. They're trying to get the present to do the past. Older people travel from the future to the present because they see where it's headed, not where it's been. That's why older people live prophetic and they understand where this whole thing is headed. They travel from the future, give the secret to the present. They don't travel to the past to give the present tradition. So older people, older lives, it's critical in all facets. Don't write them off. That's so good. So for, for us, we, we preach this <clears throat> foundation that you should have people pouring into you. You should always have someone you're pouring into. And then you should have brothers and sisters that are standing with you. Yeah. Um, you guys, when, I mean, when we were in our 20s, I mean, the questions we were asking, if we went back, it's hilarious. Um, what we didn't know uh, what we it didn't really matter if we knew, um, but the things that were so stressful. You said something at dinner last night. Um, you said life is actually kind of slow. Can you unpack that for just a minute? People ask me, "Hey, what would you say to your twenty year old self?" I would say this to a twenty year old or to my twenty year old self: "Hey, man, you got to redeem every day because you can't believe how slow this life goes." Hmm. Everybody tells you it goes fast. The only thing that makes things go fast is anxiety. Yep. I'm not far enough along. I'm not yep. married yet. I'm Anxious not. about tomorrow. So life actually goes slow, hmm. which means that in your 20s, okay, it, if you don't have that car that you want and you're all stressed out about not having something in the now, you'll be shocked if you let you live an honorable life trusting God let the Lord bring it to you in season because life actually goes slower than you, unless you're filled with anxiety and then you think I'm crazy for what I'm saying. (laughs) But it goes slower, uh, Pastor. And so you can be patient to let God unfold your life in season and time and not be so anxious about tomorrow and having it realized. And let me go, let's speak just a layer deeper, not that I can speak deeper than you, because you say it real slow and methodical and wonderful. You're like, let me tell you. I can't talk like that. Um, but to our, uh, to our single folks, because we've got a lot of them, our median age in our church uh, is 30, and we have a lot of younger uh, energy and uh, make some noise single folks. Come on, we got... This is the earlier service, 1030. It's all single. Um, 1130 at the other campuses. Um, but it's this, will it ever happen? Um, I, we, we, we meet a lot of people that are just so anxious. And we talked about it when we left the restaurant last night. I said, at that moment, like, was so, uh, it was so, it had a sticking power in my, my mind. Like, you're right, life, life is slow. But when I go back and look at all the things I was so worried about, do not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. That's what the Bible says. We're so worried about that job. We're so worried about meeting that person. We're so worried about if we meet the person, what if they're not the right one? And it's just this tug of war of anxiety. We're at an all-time high on anti-anxiety medicine, depressants, uh, suicidal ideology, all-time high. Isolation, uh, self-medicating, it's at an alt, and it's all linked to anxiety. And so unpack it a little bit deeper because there's, there's a whole group that we talk to weekly that are like, am I not lovable? Am I not valuable? Am I not seen? Like, how come nobody wants me? We hear this all the time. And uh, we have a beautiful community. And uh, we're, 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 you know, we're, every week we're preaching more and more on um, relationships and community and getting groups. But unpack it a little bit more practically. Well, I'll start by saying that anxiety is caused by a lack of trust. And we know that trust is, nobody trusts anybody about anything anymore. And that, go deeper to the next level, is that we don't trust God. 
And so we don't trust God with our tomorrow. We don't trust that he's a good God that is going to give us good gifts or be faithful to us. And that's where I go back to stewarding your life. If you will be able to spend that time with the Lord, understand who God is, understand what his character is and how it pertains to your life, then you're going to be able to have a deeper level of trust in the Lord, which then says, I can look to tomorrow and I know God's going to be there. I know he's going to show up in my struggle. I know he is present in my moment. He knows what I'm thinking. He knows what I feel. And he's already got an answer laid out for me. And so that trust sounds so flippant and we use that word so, but that is a very deep word and we have to steward that. The only time we can steward that and learn that and grow in that is at the feet of Jesus. And that's what you have to steward in your life so that when you get out to the all these places that show the things that you don't have, the things that you haven't gotten yet, the things that you haven't, um, you know, exceeded in, then you know that you can trust God that he's going to bring it in his timing. And when he does bring it, it is going to be redemptive and it is going to be good and you're going to be ready for it. That's very good. Yeah. This acute anxiety that we are all in this category five hurricane of acute anxiety, we're living in it, is because it was predicted in the scripture. Daniel 12 says in the last days that because of knowledge, people would be running to and fro throughout the whole earth. So that recklessness and search, um, that inability to settle on something true, to settle on something to love, is because of the amount of knowledge that's being produced. People are running around the whole planet. Every night we run around the whole earth like this on our, on our magic carpet. We just fly all over the world. And it's created a to and fro lifestyle. So to our, to our wonderful majority of the American church, which is single, I would say this. First of all, um, don't, don't reject marriage. There is a mass rejection of marriage going on in our society. It's strategic. It's part of the spirit of the age is to reject the family unit. So fundamentally, theologically, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 29, verse four through 10, that when you go into Babylon exile, he said, I want you to plant gardens, build houses, get married, have children, have your children have children. So there cannot be this rejection this modernist rejection that the family is illegitimate, that marriage is illegitimate because it's difficult. I would just encourage you with this, okay? Part of the dilemma, I was a university president, had all these young people in the university stressed out about their future. What am I gonna do and who am I gonna do it with? Only two questions. What am I gonna do and who am I gonna do it with? Okay, those are good questions. But the problem was is that they were so afraid of rejection that they could not allow themselves to walk by faith when it came to romance. So they're vetting it like it is um, a executive level job because they're paranoid of being stuck in a bad marriage because of they've observed it. So I've become paralyzed, I can't walk by faith. There's giants in the land. And you almost have to have that Joshua and Caleb. By all means, we're going to go into the land because God has something bigger than the giant. So, so you have to start your heart with this boundless love before boundaries. Boundaries are important. I call them standards. You have a standard in your life, but I don't lead with boundary I'm not interviewing everybody. I have a standard that vets, but I lead with boundless love. I'm willing to take the risk. So it's kind of funny. I I never told you this. This is true. I'm not making this up. Everywhere we've preached our whole life, we have this weird anointing. It's this. Somebody in a meeting, youth camps, that day they heard us, 
is sitting by somebody that became their husband or wife. Oh, wow. They didn't okay. know each other, and they were in the service. Like, we were sitting by each other, and we ended up falling in love. I don't know if that applies to 8.30 today, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I'm just letting you know yeah. we have a weird anointing with this thing. There's a lot of heads turning. Yeah, they're like... No. And there was, some, there was some that went like this. Just, Are, just, I know. Like, <laughs> just look at your spouse if you're married in the room. Like, no. no, it's not like on your right. It could be to your right, though. Like, hey, okay, okay yeah. down, right. down, down there. The yeah, but not, yeah. Down the row. Yeah. The room. But the, 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 the concern, you said that, that whole vetting process, it's almost like monster.com trying to find a job. Uh, I won't point him out. I don't think he's in this service. But there was a gentleman who talked to me over by the coffee uh, one week in between services and sharp dude, uh, pretty accomplished. And I said, man, so what's your story? He said, ah, I'm just looking for the right one. And I said, man, look around this lobby. <laughs> it's beautiful. Like, just look around the lobby, my guy. And, and we talk about this a lot that we, we watch, we watch single folks, dudes on one side, girls on the other side, and nobody's talking. And they're like, they're looking and they're, you know, and then there's the whole, like, afraid to be catfish. We're like, she doesn't look like what she did on social because she put filters on or he doesn't look the same. Um, but I told him, I said, look around it. Who's your type? And he literally looked across and said, that girl over there, I've talked to her a couple of times. I said, go talk to her. He's like, I wouldn't know what to say. So I stood there for about 10 minutes and coached him up. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Hitch right there. Pastor Hitch. Yeah, right. And I almost shoved him towards her. And uh, they are, I, I don't know if they are yet, but they're really close to, if you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. They're together now. They've been together for about nine months and they're going to be getting married. That's so special. you never know. Never know. Which brings us to our next point. I believe that your, your book speaks, it speaks to so many things, but the first thing that I saw in it is the influence that we have in relationships. But the second thing is the responsibility that we have in relationships. We have a responsibility to be the people that we are called to in relationships. Yeah. It's, it's not you, it's me. This yep. is our opportunity to recognize Everything that falls apart in life is not always someone else's issue, but we have a responsibility. And there's something that you speak sure. to so um, eloquently, I guess, in your book. And that is the responsibility that we have with the words that we speak in relationships. Would you speak about the power of our words and how those things help to keep us steadfast in relationships? Well, I would say that... Um one thing that I try to live by, one principle, is that I don't approach any relationship, but specifically my marriage, um, from a place of need. So I'm, I don't want to be needy. Can I get an amen? Who, does anybody want to not be needy? So in, when you have someone that you know is needy, you know they try to draw from you things that you're not supposed to give them. You know, whether it's emotional, whether, whether support, you know, um, and so we have to be careful, and again, it goes back to stewarding your heart, stewarding your life, that I am complete because I got up and I spent time with Jesus. I, I can approach any relationship, whether it's my husband, my children, my grandchildren, I can approach them not from a place that I'm trying to get something from you. Yeah. But really, aren't we supposed to live our life to be a blessing? Yeah. I want to bless you. And so I'm not coming at you that I need something from you to be happy. I've already accomplished that at the cross. I've already accomplished that in the throne room. And I come ready to be a blessing. Doesn't mean I can't learn from people, but I'm not coming trying to suck something from you. I've already got it from Jesus. That's so good. Yeah, it comes down to tone and timing. Tone and timing. A gentle answer turns away wrath. We tone have, and timing. We, we have built our marriage on a commitment to tone. We do not yell at each other. Wow. Um, we we just, don't either. We just chose not to scream at each other. Well, and I grew up, my, I never remember my parents screaming at each other. I know they argued, but I never remember my parents raising their voice. So I'm very... And I don't remember a day that my parents didn't. Yeah. So they screamed every day. I heard something. So they were getting, you have opposites. So, yeah, but I wanted opposite. to adopt her their method of, of family. So God's, God's helped us to do that. And so tone and timing. The second thing is, is that sometimes we, we work a lot with married couples 
and it's completely deteriorated and destroyed. Yeah. And we tell one of them, I'll isolate the guy. I said, listen, listen, will you commit for the next 30 days not to pour anything new and negative? Like, <laughs> texting each other, stop it. Stop with the thumb, scream, thumb screaming at each other. <laughs> thumb thumb screaming. screaming. That's a new phrase. Hashtag thumb scream. Thumb screams. Thumb screams. That's, that's a, yeah, I never said that. We got to remember that one. My, our new series is next month. It's called Thumb, thumb Screams. Thumb Stop. It's actually, so. Stop pouring new and negative. Stop jumping up and down on a sprained ankle. Mm. Let it rest. Wow. It's good. And if you will not pour something new and negative into this thing, so give it a chance to heal. So You've good. had children together. You have years together. There's a natural immunity inside this marriage. There's a natural bond that still exists, but we can't activate it because yeah. we constantly injure each other. So we practice giving each other a daily compliment at least once a day. But verbally. Verbally, I, yes. Like, Not just thinking it or text. I'll text her a compliment, but I will, I will verbally. One thing we mentioned in the book, it's not just the words you say, it's the sound of your voice. Yeah. So she needs to hear the sound of my voice, which is can't be heard in a text. Yeah. Right. But paying each other daily competent, tone and timing, I know when each other is open for business. Okay? We know the body clock for sex, for conversation. When she's a morning person, I'm a night person, we've had to learn to do our best work at lunch. Um, so that's at noon. Uh, I'll leave it at that. So. Uh, um, so we, we, <laughs> my son at Woodlands just went, oh my gosh. Best work Sorry, at lunch. Business you software. went there. I didn't go there. You went there. Uh, um, but I know, we know each other's body clock, mentally, emotionally, and physically. So we know when each other's open for business. We're not trying to open a locked door with conversation needs. So we, because of that tone and timing, is everything in a marriage as you learn each other's office hours. Tone of timing is also, that was really good. We should say that was awesome. <laughs> best work done at lunch. Um, <laughs> tone and timing, uh, it's, it, it is true. And it's, it's learned. And it's also learned in relationships, uh, friendships, how we parent. Uh, we were leaving the house today. And she was like, we're going to be late, you big Sasquatch. Tone and timing. I didn't say that today. <laughs> it's true though and I think it's hilarious it's so good though it's so good and it's so important because we are responsible for our words I love how you say um, your voice is so significant and so important the last thing that I want you to touch on is the integrity that we have in relationships you can finish the sentence as I read this quote because it's so important but you say in your book integrity in marriage and integrity in relationships I'll apply it to both integrity in marriage means that what you thought what you said and what you did are all the same wow. That is such a powerful statement, and I think we can all look at that statement and go, yeah, I want people that I'm in relationship with to live like that. I want people that say that they love me, that say that they care about me, to live like that. I want to know that what you said I'm going to get out of you, I am actually going to get out of you in relationship. But give us some wisdom on what that looks like. Because there still is this underlying what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas sort of uh, mindset in our culture. I said it last week. I had multiple people in the lobby say, like, you can literally, you're comfortable just handing your wife your phone and she knows your passcode. Like, oh, man, that'd be crazy for me. I'm like, why would it be crazy for you? Like, why would that be so crazy? Like, well, well why do you have my phone? Why do you have my phone? Like, what you say, what you do, are you walking the walk? Are you talking the talk? Are you the same all the time? So unlock that for just a minute. Well, um, the first thing I would say to that is that, do you know that you don't have to say everything you think? Oh, wow. So good. You don't have to say everything you think. This culture today, you know, we talk about this a lot, that, you know, people have a thought, 
and they immediately go to their phones and post it without being thoughtful about the thought. So true. It's good. So you can think something. For people deleting things right now. You're like, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> you could be thinking something, and and sometimes you have to massage it. Sometimes you have to soften it. Sometimes you have to change it from a negative to a positive connotation. And so you don't have to think everything that you um, or say everything that you think. And then also the second thing, I, one thing that I really try to work on because I tend to come from a place more of negative thinking. I'm the glass half empty person. He's the glass half full person. So with us together, we make a full glass. But, um, <laughs> but think, uh, uh, think before you speak, allow the Holy Spirit to check what's gonna come out of your mouth. Yeah. I tell you what, you will eliminate 95% of the problems that you have in your day, if you will just allow the Holy Spirit to check what you're going to say before you say it. Yeah, the integrity piece, and you do practice that beautifully. Um, it's funny because she came from the glass half full family. I came from the glass half empty family, but I'm the glass half full guy. She's the glass half empty girl. So it's weird how all of those things play out in this life. But we do have the ability as human beings to think and speak with two different things going on. We can hold in the back of our head certain thoughts that are incongruent or make promises or say promises that we have no intention of keeping. Uh, or when we get caught or when we're humiliated is most often when the disconnect takes place. Did you pay that bill? No, I didn't. Uh, did you? No. And we want to save face um, to ourselves. And we, we, we break something between the two of us. But what you think, what you say, and what you do, that congruence of those three things, if you'll just think for a moment, the, the working definition of integrity, okay, is that what I thought, what I said, and what I did are aligned. And again, marriage tests integrity, not the business world, folks. We tell more lies in our marriages than we do at work. We oftentimes have less integrity in a marriage, in a family, than we do at work because our thoughts, our words, and our actions do not align one to another. And so it is critical for trust. Now, forgiveness happens immediately. You know, we talk about our core four in that book about forgiveness. Don't let something temporary become something permanent. You gotta cleanse a wound before you close the wound. These are very critical uh, um, ideas about an ongoing marriage but that we have to make certain that we are speaking with a sense of trust. Forgiveness is instant, friends. Trust takes time. Yeah. So when you throw away trust by an absence of integrity, you've set your marriage back, okay? Forgiveness is instant, trust takes time. So if you wanna move into the good life, longevity of days, 1 Peter 3.10, this integrity piece, thought, word and deed aligned is critical. It's critical. So good. Your reputation is easier to keep than it is to get back once you've lost it. Yeah. But thank God for his grace, for every goof up. Come on, somebody, his mercy yeah. for every mistake and his redemptive <laughs> kindness. Amazing. Okay, one of my favorite parts of this book, literally, I, I, I read through the whole thing because it's, it's not an overwhelmingly intimidating read either. It's a read that you, you want and to read it. And it has beautiful it. romantic it's, photography all the way through. It <laughs> does. And it's a pretty like coffee table style book. Yes. Um, we would not be advocating for it so much if we didn't truly believe in these two and the life that they have lived and the words on the page. But when I got to the end, family, I was amazed by the whole book. I wasn't surprised, but when I got to the end, there is this last section at the very end that almost had me in tears. At the end, there is a QR code, and they have filmed videos for anyone who is in need relationally, in need in your marriage, that feels like you're at the end, that feels like you can't take it's anymore. Lifeline. You are absolutely, it's done. You can't do anymore. They have a QR code and these recorded sessions almost. Yeah, it, it's actually one very brief video, it's 15 yeah. minutes. And it's for those, it's for every marriage, but it's especially if you have a friend that their marriage is over, yeah. they're, they're divorcing. The, it's already done, dead, sealed in the ground. We have seen the Lord do what only Christianity does. Christianity brings things back from the dead. That's what makes us different than every other thing on the planet. Yep. Things yep. come back from the dead. 
So this video, we teach you for seven days how to do something. For seven days, if the marriage is totally over, dead, divorced, and it may only be one person watching it. So if you have a family member or a friend, their marriage is over, just get them the book and send them to that very, it's a free little video just off their phone that will, that will possibly be the lifeline yeah, yeah. It's amazing. for resurrection of a dead and uh, buried marriage. So, Amazing. So, Frank, so we believe. encourage you to make sure and go out to the lobby. And They're available at all these. of our campuses. They're available at our campuses. We do have a limited supply, but you can also find them online. So we would love it if, Pastor Karen, would you just pray over our church family, pray over those watching online, and for just that heart of being steadfast, steadfast. or whatever the Lord leads you to. Lord, we thank you, Father, for the opportunity to deepen our understanding, God, of what it looks like to you to be in relationship, Father. We know that you're all about relationship, God, whether it's friendship, whether it's family, whether it's marriage, God, parent to child, Lord, whatever area, God, that we find ourselves in, Lord, I pray that we would, Father, be able to walk steadfastly, Lord, and humble ourselves, God, before one another so that it can bring us together, not pull us apart. God, I pray, Father, that your blessing would be upon, we know your blessing is upon those who walk obediently, those who walk in alignment with your word. So God, teach us your word, God. Help us to, to go to the foot of the cross and to spend time in your presence, to learn who you are so that we can then impart that to those around us, God. I pray blessing for every person here today, God, that you would, Lord, give us, Lord, your wisdom and your understanding, Father, your counsel, that we we would seek you for direction, God, that we would walk in the fear of the Lord, God, that we would have you as the Lord of our lives, Father, so that we can live in your favor, God. And I just pray blessing and hope and peace and love over each person in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Dr. Hagen, will you, will you extend uh, an altar call invitation for salvation, rededication? Absolutely. Just, let's just take another 30 seconds. You're across the house today. See, I'm here, and I have never given my life to Jesus Christ. I need Christ to come in my life. I need that starting point. Not a marriage conference or relationship conference. I need Christ to come in to cleanse my sin, to live in my life. I want my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I, I, I want to become a believer in Christ with our heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're in this service today and you need Jesus Christ in your life, a prayer of salvation, would you just quickly slip a hand high? And I just want to pray for you as we're done. Put it up right now, right now across this building. That's right. That's right. You're not alone. There's people joining you across this room, right, left, all the way. Keep it up. Keep it up in the air. Thank you, Jesus. Just keep it up. We're going to pray together. This is real. A thief said, remember me. And Jesus said, today you're with me. This is not complicated. It just has to be sincere. Can we pray this all together? Dear Jesus, come into my life. I love you, Jesus. I don't know a lot. But what I do know, I'm, I'm coming towards you. Forgive me, Jesus of my sin. I believe, Jesus, you're the Son of God. You died on that cross. You rose from the dead. And you alone give eternal life. I am yours, Jesus, from this day forward. Fill me now with healing and hope and joy. Thank you for my new family here at Hope City. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Come on, Hope City. Can we give God praise?